I'm Jacob McDonough. I'm founder and portfolio manager of McDonough Investments. I manage a concentrated portfolio of stocks for clients in a separately managed account structure. And this is the 10K Podcast. This is the first episode of the 10K Podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking about the 1974 annual report for GEICO, the government employees insurance company. GEICO has an interesting history. The firm was founded in 1936 by Leo Goodwin and at first focused on providing insurance just to government employees. Goodwin worked at USAA, a firm that is still an important insurance company today. USAA focuses on providing insurance for military personnel, and Geico was modeled after the company. Both companies avoided having agents and instead relied on direct marketing through the mail, later through the phone, and on the internet. In 1948, Ben Graham bought half the company for the investment fund he managed called Graham Newman. Ben Graham was a mentor and teacher of Warren Buffett. Here is Warren Buffett talking about Ben Graham and Geico from his 1995 letter to shareholders. I attended Columbia University's business school in 1950 through 1951, not because I cared about the degree it offered, but because I wanted to study under Ben Graham, then teaching there. The time I spent in Ben's class was a personal high and quickly induced me to learn all I could about my hero. I turned first to who's who in America, finding there, among other things, that Ben was the chairman of Geico, to me an unknown company in an unfamiliar industry. A librarian next referred me to Best Fire and Casualty Insurance Manual, where I learned that Geico was based in Washington, D.C. So on a Saturday in January 1951, I took the train to Washington and headed for Geico's downtown headquarters. To my dismay, the building was closed, but I pounded on the door until a custodian appeared. I asked this puzzled fellow if there was anyone in the office I could talk to, and he said he'd seen one man working on the sixth floor, and thus I met Lorimer Davidson, assistant to the president who was later to become CEO. Though my only credentials were that I was a student of Graham's, Davey graciously spent four hours or so showering me with both kindness and instruction. No one has ever received a better half-day course in how the insurance industry functions, nor in the factors that enable one company to excel over others. As Davey made clear, Geico's method of selling, direct marketing, gave it an enormous cost advantage over competitors that sold through agents, a form of distribution so ingrained in the business of these insurers that it was impossible for them to give it up. After my session with Davey, I was more excited about Geico than I'd ever been about a stock. There are some interesting aspects to this excerpt from Buffett's 1995 shareholder letter. First off, he was curious about Ben Graham and Geico, so he hopped on a train and knocked on the door of the business on a Saturday. The door was locked, but he pounded on the door until a custodian came. If you're curious about something, go after it and be aggressive. Next, the assistant to the president spent four hours on a Saturday with Buffett talking about the company. Buffett said this was an unknown company to him in an unknown industry. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time talking about anything for four hours, let alone a subject or company I know little about. For Lorimer and Davison to talk to Buffett at all, a random stranger, was very nice. But to talk for four hours shows how special of a person Buffett is. He must have been impressive and been asking good questions. A short while after he met Lorimer Davidson, Buffett bought Geico stock and wrote a report on the company titled, The Security I Like Best. The article was written in December 1951. Buffett wrote that, The company has no agents or branch offices. As a result, policyholders receive standard auto insurance policies at premium discounts running as high as 30% off manual rates. He went on to say that, Probably the biggest attraction of Geico is the profit margin advantage it enjoys. The ratio of underwriting profit to premiums earned in 1949 was 27.5% for Geico, compared to 6.7% for the 135 stock casualty and surety companies summarized by Bess. Due to Geico's low cost of operations, they can basically sell their product at a lower cost while still earning a higher profit margin than many competitors. The profit margin that Buffett referenced for Geico was extremely high compared to what is normal for the industry. In terms of the valuation of the stock, Buffett wrote that, at the present price of about eight times the earnings of 1950, a poor year for the industry, 
it appears that no price is being paid for the tremendous growth potential of the company. Buffett mentions that the valuation was eight times earnings, but notes that it was a poor year for the industry. The multiple on earnings can mean very different things if you're talking about a poor year for the industry or if the industry went through a temporary period of increased business like e-commerce during the pandemic of 2020. Despite the reasonable valuation, this was a growing company. The Geico had almost 144,000 policyholders in 1950, up from just over 50,000 policyholders in 1945. It had a compound annual growth rate of 22.7% for the five-year period in terms of policyholder growth. With just 144,000 policyholders, this was still a small company, but it was growing at a nice pace. Buffett wrote that it was valued at about eight times earnings, with earnings per share of $3.92 and 250,000 shares. This means that the valuation of the company was about $7.8 million. It was valued at $4.6 billion when Berkshire acquired it in 1995. Progressive today is at a $79 billion market cap, and I'd think Geico would be somewhere near that mark if it was a separate public company. I don't know what's fair value today, but I would guess it's somewhere in the ballpark of a company like Progressive. From $7.8 million at the time of Buffett's article to somewhere in the ballpark of $79 billion today, I'd say that was a pretty good call by Mr. Buffett. I already mentioned Ben Graham, Buffett's mentor and professor at Columbia. Graham wrote one of the classic books on investing called The Intelligent Investor. The fourth revised edition of The Intelligent Investor, which was updated by Graham in 1971 and 72 and was published in 1973, had an interesting commentary on his investment in Geico. Graham said his fund average returns of 20% per year. He was known for buying stocks with low valuations where he was focused on downside protection. In the postscript to this revised edition of The Intelligent Investor, he wrote that, In the year in which the first edition of this book appeared, an opportunity was offered to the Partners Fund to purchase a half interest in a growing enterprise. For some reason, the industry did not have Wall Street appeal at the time, and the deal had been turned down by quite a few important houses. But the pair was impressed by the company's possibilities. What was decisive for them was that the price was moderate in relation to current earnings and asset value. The partners went ahead with the acquisition, amounting in dollars to about one-fifth of their fund. They became closely identified with the new business interest, which prospered. Graham mentioned the valuation was cheap based on earnings and on asset value. They made it one-fifth of the fund, which is a very large position. He went on to say, In fact, it did so well that the price of its shares advanced to 200 times or more the price paid for the half interest. The advance far outstripped the actual growth in profits, and almost from the start, the quotation appeared much too high in terms of the partner's own investment standards. But since they regarded the company as sort of a family business, they continued to maintain a substantial ownership of the shares despite the spectacular share price rise. A large number of participants in their funds did the same, and they became millionaires through their holdings in this one enterprise, plus later organized affiliates. Graham admits that he usually would have sold Geico pretty quickly, but since it felt like a family business, he held. Nick Sleep and Case Zakaria, two investors who managed the Nomad Investment Partnership, asked the question in one of their letters of, why is it that no one but the founding Walton family owned Walmart all the way through? Your mentality is just different when you're a founder and when you feel as though you own a family business. You feel some sort of loyalty or duty to, to hold on to your ownership when it's a family business. You know, it's difficult to hold on to even a great business like Geico or Walmart for so long without this founder mentality. A footnote in The Intelligent Investor says, because of a legal technicality, Graham and Newman were directed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to spin off or distribute Graham Newman Corp's Geico stake to the fund's shareholders. An investor who owned 100 shares of Graham Newman at the beginning of 1948, worth $11,413, and who then held on to the Geico distribution, would have had $1.66 million by 1972. 
What this tells me is that Graham's track record of having investment returns of 20% per year excludes the performance of Geico, Graham's best investment. Graham says, Ironically enough, the aggregate profits accruing from the single investment decision far exceeded the sum of all the others realized through 20 years of wide-ranging operations in the partner's specialized fields, involving much investigation, endless pondering, and countless individual decisions. Another not-so-obvious moral to the story is that one lucky break or one supremely shrewd decision, can we tell them apart, may count for more than a lifetime of journeyman efforts. That is a very humble and intellectually honest remark, and it makes a strong case for letting your winners ride and not cutting your flowers and watering the weeds. Everything sounds great, right? Geico has the stamp of approval of Ben Graham and Warren Buffett, and we have the benefit of knowing how successful Geico, Geico still is today, so many years later. Well, the story is a little trickier than that. Graham was writing about the success of his Geico investment in 1973. By 1975, Geico was on the verge of bankruptcy. This is why investing can be so interesting and so difficult. Was it a good lesson to hold Geico? Yeah, I would say so over the long term. But with that being said, Graham's entire investment was almost worthless just a short time period after writing that it was up 200 times. So what happened? This is why studying the historical annual reports can be so interesting. And this is why I decided to take another look at the 1974 annual report for GEICO. So now on to the actual annual report. In 1974, GEICO was the third largest stock company in the auto insurance industry. Including mutual insurance companies, they were the fifth largest in the auto industry. Over 80% of their premiums written were from auto insurance, while the rest mostly came from homeowners insurance. In the annual report, it says that in Fortune Magazine's 27th annual review of the major fire insurance companies, based on the average results from the five-year period from 1969 to 1973, Geico was ranked first on return on equity, first in return on capital, first in growth in sales, and second in growth in earnings per share. First, let me uh, describe the insurance business. On the balance sheet side of things, an insurance company doesn't technically require any capital to operate. There's no need for inventory, equipment, or real estate in order to function. But an insurance company does need capital to fall back on in case of losses from its policies. This means that the capital in an insurance company can be in cash, stocks, or bonds. The assets of an insurance company are funded with liabilities from policyholder funds, as well as from equity capital, which are shareholder funds. Policyholders funds are sometimes referred to as float, and those generally have to be kept in bonds or in cash. Equity capital can be invested in stocks, but many insurance companies also invest a portion of their equity capital into bonds as well. In 1974, Geico had equity capital on a gap basis of $143.7 million. The firm had $60 million of common stocks and $40 million of preferred stocks. Geico invested in over $400 million worth of bonds, making it by far the largest asset on the balance sheet. On the income statement side of things, revenue comes from selling an insurance policy. The company will then recognize expenses for claims incurred from its policies throughout the year, as well as from its estimate of future claims on its policies. You also have corporate overhead expenses as you need an office and you need to hire employees. The revenue minus these expenses equals the underwriting profit or loss for the company. Besides an underwriting profit or loss, an insurance company should have investment income from its fixed income portfolio, as well as from any equity securities it owns. After 28 straight years of underwriting profits, Geico finally had an underwriting loss in 1974. The underwriting loss amounted to $5.9 million that year. The firm had investment income of $32.3 million, so Geico was still able to earn a profit. After tax, net income amounted to $25.1 million, which was a return on equity of 17.5%. After 28 straight years of having underwriting profits, they still have a return on equity of 17.5%,
when underwriting turns negative. Not bad. And this took place in what management claimed was the most difficult year in the history of the property and casualty insurance industry. In the annual report, this is how management describes the situation. Confronting an unprecedented combination of recessionary national economy, mounting unemployment, the worst infl inflation in decades, serious premium rate inadequacies, and a depressed stock market, the results of our operations for 1974 afford a basis of confidence in the ability of our company to cope successfully with the adversities assailing our industry. They are expressing confidence in the ability of the company to cope, and again, spoiler alert, next year they will be on the brink of bankruptcy. Management went on to say that, underwriting, underwriting results for 1974 showed the impact of relentless pressures of double-digit inflation on claim settlement and policy reserving costs, compounded by the mandatory rate reductions accompanying the enactment of no-fault laws, no laws in several states. What they're saying here is that not only are costs increasing at double-digit rates due to inflation, but regulators are forcing industry participants to reduce prices in certain cases. With revenue down and expenses up, profit margins are obviously going to be under attack. In 1974, the property and casualty insurance industry sh suffered its greatest underwriting loss since 1932. The Consumer Price Index of Medical-Related Services rose by 11.4% during 1974, and the auto repair costs rose by 13.8%. Back to the annual report. Early in the year, there was reluctance among regulators to grant rate increases in the expectation that the shortage of gasoline would reduce accident frequency because of a, decre <clears throat> because of a decreased use in automobiles, increased participation in carpools, greater use in public transit, and observance of the 55 mile per hour speed limit. That quote shows the difficulty of predicting future costs that regulators and underwriters have to deal with. Maybe it was reasonable for regulators to think a gasoline shortage would reduce the use of cars and therefore lower insurance claims. Also, Sammy Hagar's classic rock song, I Can't Drive 55, didn't come out until 1984, a decade after this annual report, so regulators were unable yet to hear an artist like Hagar so eloquently express the inability of the public to observe those kind of speed limits. Geico reported an underwriting loss of $5.9 million for 1974, but this was due to a very concerning fourth quarter. The firm reported an underwriting loss of $17.3 million in just the fourth quarter alone, the worst underwriting result in Geico's history. The combined ratio was 111.7%. So things were getting worse and in a hurry. A combined ratio of 100% means the firm broke even on underwriting without taking into account any investment income. A combined ratio below 100% means there was an underwriting profit. But the combined ratio was 111.7% for Geico in the fourth quarter alone. For the entire year, the combined ratio was 101.2%, with 15.8% coming from the expense ratio which represents overhead costs, and the other 85.4% coming from the loss ratio or the loss on the insurance policies. Geico states that the aggregate expense ratio for the insurance industry was 28.5% in 1974. Geico had an expense ratio of 15.8%. This shows that Geico had a major advantage on the expense ratio, which was the result of lower overhead costs due to its direct marketing approach without the use of insurance agents. This means that the company could have lower prices on its policies and therefore have a worse loss ratio and still earn better profits than its competitors. Drivers are forced to have car insurance and so many people just hunt for the lowest price. In many cases, Geico was able to have lower prices and that helped their business thrive. During the period, Geico was very focused on growth. Management noted that they increased the policies in force for the 32nd consecutive year, reaching 2.6 million policies in force. Premiums written had more than doubled in the last five years. The company had just 51,697 policies in force in 1945. This means that the number of policies in force compounded at almost 15% per year over the 29 year period. 
Growth is a double-edged sword, though, for financial companies like insurers or banks. Of course, you'd like your business to grow and make more money each year, but growth can also get you into trouble and increase risk. Geico is going to know more about a driver who has been a customer for years compared to a brand new customer. To help continue the growth engine, Geico removed occupational and age qualifications for drivers near the end of 1973 as well. At the end of 1974, 12.5% of their new policyholders were from job or age groups that previously were ineligible to be customers of Geico. Maybe the company didn't understand this new group of customers as well as they thought. Growth alone can present risk for financial companies, but an insurance company expanding to new groups and demographics needs to be extra careful that its underwriting is of high quality. Geico in particular had a few unique reasons why its growth could have been seen as risky. The company was required to have both voluntary and involuntary written business. Voluntary refers to the customers that Geico chose to do business with. Insurance is a regulated business in the U.S., and state regulators played an influential role in the industry. According to the annual report, involuntary policies were those risks and exposures assigned to us by the states, uh, state regulators, they mean, to allocate proportionally among licensed companies the insurance protection of motorists unable to obtain coverages through normal channels. Even though our involuntary written premium volume accounted for only 6.7% of our total automobile insurance premium writings in 1974, the grossly inadequate rate levels for this classification of business over which we can exercise no underwriting prerogatives, caused staggering underwriting loss of $12.4 million for the year. Later, they go on to say that, these are risk pooling mechanisms under which motorists who are unable to obtain insurance in the open market because of their high risk potential are assigned to the licensed companies for coverage, with each company paying the net loss which develops on risks assigned to it. This assignment is on the basis of voluntary automobile writings. A few things here. First, the involuntary portion of the insurance business caused the entire underwriting loss for 1974 when it made up just 6.7% of premiums written. Geico had a total overall underwriting loss of $5.9 million for the year, while just the involuntary portion of the business had an underwriting loss of $12.4 million. This means that the voluntary policies were profitable. Geico had no say in what prices to charge on these involuntary policies as they were directed by state regulators. So it put insurance companies like Geico in a tough position. This means that there was an increased urgency for Geico's voluntary policies to be profitable since they knew the involuntary portion would be highly unprofitable. Importantly, the involuntary portion of the business is assigned based on the level of revenue at your company, the premiums written. This means that the more Geico grew, the more involuntary insurance business Geico would have to take on. This was an added risk to the company's growth. Due to the losses from involuntary policies, Geico needed its voluntary policies to be very profitable. Similarly, Geico would have to pay guarantee funds and this would make it even more important for its voluntary policies to be highly profitable. Here's a quote from the annual report. A further erosion of underwriting income in 1974 was attributable to the alarming increase in insurance company insolvencies. Insurance guarantee associations have been established in 48 jurisdictions to guarantee payment of meritorious claims on behalf of insolvent insurance carriers. The cost of being born by all licensed companies on an equitable law sharing formula. Thereby, the insured public is protected against the poorly managed or unscrupulous companies and the integrity of the entire industry is maintained. So basically, the general public doesn't need to worry about the solvency of the insurance company they choose. If they buy a policy and that insurance company goes bankrupt, all of the other insurance companies split the cost of that policy and pay out the claims that are owed. Um, at least in this case for auto insurance. Buffett wrote about this in his 1986 letter to shareholders. The trends in national indemnity's traditional business, and this is Buffett's letter, by the way. The trends in national indemnity's traditional business, the writing of commercial auto and general liability policies through general agents, suggests how gun-shy other insurers became for a while and how brave they are now getting. 
Ironically, the managers, managers of certain major new competitors are the very same managers that just a few years ago bankrupted insurers that were our old competitors. Through state-mandated guarantee funds, we must pay some of these losses these managers left unpaid, and now we find them writing the same sort of business under a new name, C'est la guerre. C'est la guerre apparently is French for it's the war. Buffett is saying that insurance managers charged too low prices, went bankrupt, leaving the more sober and higher quality insurance companies on the hook for the bad policies. Then as the other insurance companies are paying the bill, those failed insurance managers started a new company and tried it all over again. That's just one of the difficult realities of the insurance business. Speaking of risk, Geico had an extreme amount of leverage during this time period. I don't mean leverage in terms of debt, as Geico didn't have too much of this. Geico had a high amount of operating leverage. The ratio of written premiums to sat statutory surplus was at 5.44 in 1974, up from 4.06 in 1973. This is extremely high. The insurance industry averaged a ratio of 2.74 in 1974 and 1.97 in 1973. So the average insurance company might be one or two times levered, while Geico had four or five times leverage. One way to think about this is each time an insurance company makes a sale, it is taken on risk because they might have to pay out claims on that policy. Insurance companies then have some amount of equity capital to fall back on if there are losses on insurance policies. So a common way to look at risk and leverage in insurance is to compare revenue to capital, which in this case would be premiums written compared to statutory surplus. During this time period, stock market valuations went down, and this reduced the capital that many insurance companies had since a portion of their capital is typically in stocks. This leverage was very important as it related to the highly unprofitable involuntary insurance policies. I mentioned that involuntary portion was assigned based on your level of revenue. A company like Geico had extremely high revenue compared to its equity capital. So this means that its equity capital was even more exposed than average to the involuntary business. This is very important as it relates to risk. In the annual report, Geico goes on to attempt to justify or rationalize its leverage, at least in my opinion. They write that, During most of our history, the ratio of our premium writings to surplus has been higher than the industry's aggregate ratio, a condition which the regulating authorities have accepted because of our consistent underwriting profitability and conservative investment policy. They go on to say that, A recent analysis by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners concluded that the significance of the ratio of premium writings to surplus for a casualty company must be evaluated in the context of its composite record, including adequacy of reserves, quality of investment portfolio, cash dividend policy, reinsurance protection against major losses, cash flow, liquidity, competence and management, and similar criteria. Yeah, sure, you need to take full context of the insurance company and the environment it is in to know how much risk it's taking on. That's true. However, insurance companies need to be very cautious as it relates to leverage, its growth, and the rates it's charging, because one bad period can wipe out a lifetime full of wealth building, which we're about to see here at Geico. Geico says that management is fully cognizant of the relative significance of the increase in our ratio of premium writings to surplus, and we are confident that our company will continue to meet the most stringent tests of our financial strength and stability. Management says this in the 1974 annual report. In the following year, the company will be on the brink of bankruptcy. Despite these tough times, Geico is reinvesting for more growth. Management writes that, During 1974, new sales and service facilities were opened at 30 locations, marking one of the most significant expansions of our marketing structure in our history. Geico's management is basically writing that times were tough, but they're in a good shape and in investing for growth. It is interesting to compare Geico to Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett during this period. The tone of Buffett and his shareholder letters was very different, in my opinion, versus the tone of Geico's management. Also, the corporate structure of Berkshire is very different from Geico, but Berkshire's corporate structure is very different from just about anyone. But it's still interesting to compare it to Geico in this period. In terms of tone, Geico's management seems confident 
and seems to be reassuring investors that they have everything under control. They say that the results of our operations for 1974 afford a basis of confidence in the ability of our company to, co to cope successfully with the adversities assailing our industry. They say that they are confident that our company will continue to meet the most stringent tests of our financial strength and stability. Buffett, on the other hand, had a much more negative and cautious tone about Berkshire. In his 1974 letters to shareholders, Buffett wrote, The outlook for 1975 is not encouraging. Insurance underwriting is a large question mark at this time. It certainly won't be a satisfactory year in this area. It could be an extremely poor one. During this period, we plan to continue to build financial strength and liquidity, preparing for the time when insurance rates become adequate and we can once again aggressively pursue opportunities for growth in this area. Buffett goes on in his letter to explain why the insurance industry could be heading for trouble. If you were a heavily leveraged company like Geico, you would really want to batten down the hatches for this storm. Two different times in this letter, Buffett mentions that other insurance companies are under-reserving for losses. He says, it also has been apparent that many insurance organizations, major as well as minor, have been guilty of significant under-reserving of losses, which inevitably produces faulty information as to the true cost of the product being sold. Later, Buffett writes that, loss reserves for many giant companies still appear to be understated by significant amounts, which means that these competitors continue to underestimate their true costs. This is a five-page letter for Buffett, and he wrote about that situation two separate times throughout the letter. This was an important point he was trying to communicate. Buffett goes on to say that, at this time, it appears that insurers must experience even more devastating underwriting results before they take appropriate pricing action. Buffett went on to call the underwriting loss in Berkshire's reinsurance segment as horrendous. He said that the expansion of their home and automobile insurance company subsidiary into Florida proved disastrous. Horrendous and disastrous. This man is not sugarcoating. This letter sounds to me like a warning to his insurance managers and employees that tough times are coming and they better be ready and they better be raising prices. Berkshire had equity capital on a gap basis of $88.2 million in 1974. It had insurance premiums of 60, of $60.6 .6 million that year. Remember earlier I mentioned that Geico was levered four to five times during this period, meaning it had insurance revenue four to five times higher than its capital. Berkshire had insurance revenue that was less than one times its capital. Not only was its operating leverage far lower, but it had a diverse earning stream coming in from other industries such as banking and retailing. Berkshire is extremely unusual in its structure. Typically throughout its history, it took on less risk from operating leverage in the insurance business, had its equity capital more heavily weighted towards stocks than some of its competitors would, and had an unusually diverse collection of businesses under its umbrella. Part of the reason Berkshire never got itself into trouble over the years was due to the benefits from this structure, but also the excellent management by Buffett and Munger are clearly responsible as well. The valuation of Geico is interesting to look at during this period. The stock price of Geico got up to $58.88 per share in 1973 at the high point, which came in the first quarter of that year. The stock crashed to a low of $14.63 in the second quarter of 1974. That is a decline of 75%. Geico's valuation went from over a billion dollars down to $259 million. The overall market went through a very difficult period as well. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped by 45% from early 1973 until December 1974. It was a difficult period for many companies and the valuations dropped to low levels. Interestingly, the valuation of Geico was decently high pretty soon before it came close to bankruptcy. In 1973, the valuation went up to a billion dollars while it earned $32.6 million in its previous year. This is a valuation of 32, 32 times earnings and had a price to book ratio of more than six times. In 1974, earnings declined by 21% and the book value declined by 13% while the market capitalization declined 75% from peak to trough. This means that a multiple compression was the main driver in the decline of Geico's valuation, as opposed to just worse business results at that point in time. At the low price of 1974, 
Geico was selling at a little over eight times earnings with a price to book ratio of about 1.6. It was selling for about eight times earnings when Buffett bought it back in the 1950s. And it's humbling to see this valuation and think to myself that I probably would have been tempted to buy a stock like Geico at the 1974 low point. This was a great company that had long sold for a premium valuation and the valuation finally became what appeared to be a little more reasonable. Additionally, the company had a poor year in terms of underwriting results, but that was the first underwriting loss in 29 years. This kind of situation would make my ears perk up and cause me to seriously consider owning a company like this. Well, another spoiler alert, but even at the lowest level in 1974, the stock price declined a whole lot more afterwards. The stock price of Geico went from $14.63 in 1974 down to $2.13 at the low point of 1976, which is a decline of 85%. So what I'm saying is it declined 75% from 1973 high to the 74 low, but then even after that, it declined another 85% down to the low point uh, just two years later in 1976. This highlights a reason why I was so interested in studying historical annual reports like this one. Since if I'm being honest, reading this 1974 annual report makes it look like an appealing situation to me. I might have invested if I was around in 1974. Well, I would have had to suffer through a decline of 85% and a near bankruptcy. Hopefully I can learn from this. And a main takeaway is the risk involved in leveraged, leveraged institutions like insurance companies is, is an important risk to consider. One bad year after 28 good ones, and the stock is down 75%. Think to yourself, would you have invested? There are some important lessons for investors. Valuations can be high and the consensus can be rosy, like it was for Geico in 1973, and then things can change quickly. The stock price of even your favorite company can decline by 75%. It happens sometimes. But I feel like investors forget this sometimes during bull markets. Another lesson is to be wary of fin leveraged financial institutions. If you're going to own an insurance company like Geico, you have to be very confident in the underwriting ability of the firm and confident that the management team is disciplined because the firm can have high quality underwriting for decades before taking their eye off the ball during one period. Insurance companies can learn from this period for Geico as well. You don't need to risk your entire firm just for relentless growth. It is okay to grow a little slower or even have your business shrink sometimes. Survival needs to come first. The last point I want to make here is from a quote from the book, The Snowball by Alice Schroeder. In it, it says, in 1975, I looked again at Geico and was startled by what I saw after a few rule of thumb calculations about loss reserves. It was clear in a 60 second examination that the company was far under reserved and the situation was getting worse. I went in to see the CEO, Norm Giddin, on one of my Washington Post trips. I had known and liked Norm for 20 years on a casual basis. He was friendly, but he had no interest at all in listening to my comments. They were in deep denial. He really sort of hustled me out of the office and would not respond on the subject. Buffett hadn't owned a Geico for years, but still he went in to talk to the CEO. Two of his heroes, Ben Graham and Lorimer Davidson, heavily owned the stock and Buffett cared about what happened to them and to the company. Geico was in denial. Lorimer Davidson retired in 1970 from being the CEO. The management team that followed after him are who led Geico into this mess. The lesson here, try to avoid denial. We all do it sometimes, but try to be honest with yourself and your situation. And also, when Warren Buffett comes to see you, listen to what he has to say. That is where I'm going to leave off for this annual report. In the next episode, I'm going to pick back up in the year that follows for Geico, the 1975 annual report. In the meantime, I'd love to hear any questions or comments from listeners. You can reach me at jacob at mcdonough-investments.com or on Twitter at mcd underscore investments. Thanks for listening.